Hi, everybody, and welcome to Session 7 of IROC, the Introduction to Radiation Oncology Curriculum, or Radiation Oncology Emergencies. My name is Rafael Yechieli. I'm an Associate Professor at University of Miami, and I'm uh, very excited to be able to deliver this lecture on behalf of IROC and ROCSIG. So let's get started. So when you're thinking about a radiation oncology emergency, you got to start from the beginning. And the beginning is when you get notified about it. So first things first, you're going to get paged and they're going to be reaching out to you. And I, I really wanted to take a step back here and before we even get started, recognize how to approach getting paged. So in general, it's never really a good time to get a page. And especially when on the phone, they're calling you and telling you that there's some emergent radiation oncology issue. Well, you probably have other things you're planning on doing that now you need to go and deal with this other thing that has just come up. And what I want you to remember, even though throughout your experience, you're going to find that a lot of the issues aren't really emergencies. And we're going to talk about how to deal with emergencies in this session. I want you to remember that to the person making the call to you, to them, it kind of is an emergency. You see, they're dealing with someone with cancer. And to us, this is routine. This is our everyday job. But to the referring doctor, they have a problem that they don't know what to do with it. And that in itself is an emergency to them. So how we act and how we interact with our referring providers, actually, we can really help them. Of course, we'll help our patients. But hopefully, at the end of this session, you'll also know how to help the doctors on the other line. So what do you do when you get paged? First of all, Call back, be courteous, look up the chart, and first ask, like, has the patient ever been radiated before? And then really the most important thing is try to confirm that there's been an actual diagnosis of cancer. Review available images with radiology, call the attending, and then of course, always see the patient. Another important introduction I'd like to make is that anytime we're talking about principles of palliation and including emergencies, is the first step is to do no harm. First, do no harm. And the way I like to think about this is that any treatment, anything we're offering our patients should help the patients live longer and or better. At least one of them, hopefully both. But if our treatments are not gonna help our patients live longer and are not gonna help our patients live better, we should not do it. The three things to consider is number one, is this really an emergency? Number two, is radiation the best option for this patient? Or should we be recommending other non-radiation treatments? And number three, which is really important, is the patient stable enough to bring down to the department? So let's start from the beginning. What is the most common radiation emergency? I'm gonna wait here because it's one of these five choices. Is it painful bone metastasis? Is it spinal cord compression? Is it symptomatic brain mets? Is it SVC syndrome or is it vaginal bleeding? Spinal cord compression. That is the most common radiation emergency. So in a multi-center pattern of care study conducted in 140 institutions in 2003, so it's relatively old data, but still true, 42% um, of all emergencies were spinal cord compression. Here's a case, 67 year old male, no past medical history, presents with a two week history of bilateral lower extremity weakness. They get an MRI and it shows a compression fracture of T8 with spinal cord compression. And you can see that really well right here the compression fracture, as well as the compression of the spinal cord. A little tip looking at the sagittal here is that in T2 imaging, the CSF is light. So you want to see if there's any disruption to that CSF, and you can see that pretty clearly over here. So you go up, you see the patient, you review the images, and or even before you see the patient, you can start asking, what other symptoms would you want to be asking about? So the common symptoms for spinal cord compression are back pain, most common, 
decreased motor function or paralysis, decreased sensation, urinary or fecal incontinence, urinary retention, go both ways, huh? And of course, hyperflexia, extensor plans or response to dermatoma or increased sensation, things that you learned about in medical school. They actually come about. So what are the steps you should take if we hear about a case of a potential or something you suspect is spinal cord compression? First of all, request enhanced contrast enhanced imaging of the whole spine. You know why? Because if they have metastatic cord compression at one site in the T-spine, they might also have it in the C-spine. You don't want to miss that. Number two, conform a cancer diagnosis. And if they haven't been diagnosed with cancer, work on getting a tissue confirmation to get a diagnosis of cancer. Number three, really important, go see and examine the patient. Now, if the patient is symptomatic and we know the diagnosis of cancer, the approach to take is this, dexamethasone, 10 milligrams, bolus, followed by four milligrams every six hours. And of course, like all the steroids we're gonna talk about, always try to taper them as soon as possible. And we could even discuss this with the team up front saying, hey, we're starting this for symptom relief, but it's not gonna be a long-term thing. It will happen if we don't have this discussion where patients will come in for follow-up a couple months later and they've been on steroids the entire time, high dose. And if it's a spinal cord compression, always request a neurosurgical evaluation. So what's the best initial steps of management? A, do we just initiate steroids and get them to surgery? B, do we initiate steroids and just bring them down and get them to radiation? Three, should we just initiate steroids, get surgery, and radiation? Four, D, should we just radiate? Or five, should we just operate? There we go. The best approach for spinal cord compression is initiate the steroids, get surgery to decompress the cord, and then radiate after surgery. But like we said, and I've mentioned this a couple times now, you always have to make sure that we're dealing with a cancer diagnosis. So let's take a look at this set of imaging. We've had two compression fractures. We have, this is a T1 image. As you can see, the uh, CSF is dark. And we even have contrast enhancements in the vertebral bodies. And they did a diagnosis. I'm sorry, they got a, di they got a biopsy and the patient had osteoporotic bone disease, not cancer. Radiation does not help very much for osteoporotic bone disease. What about radiation alone for spinal cord compression? So I said, like we said before, um, initial recommendations for, for symptomatic cord compression is start them on steroids, get surgery involved to have them decompress it, and then radiate. But Say the team um, recommends that they don't want to operate. They just want to operate on the patient for whatever reason it might be. So, and we're going to be treating with radiation alone. This is actually really common. What's the best dose to offer this patient? Um, you know, the patient wants to know, we're seeing them. Could we do 30 grain 10? Should we do 20 grain 5? Or should we just do 8 grain 1? Or is it dealer's choice. Dealer's choice. Any of the above fractionation schemas are appropriate. So you get called in on the weekend. It is a symptomatic cord compression and they are not taking the patient's surgery. What do you do? First of all, confirm store steroid initiation. If they're symptomatic and it's a weekend and you're calling in your team to treat this patient, make sure they're on steroids. Now, in the setting of immunotherapy, steroid use as a whole is uh, a little more controversial, but at the same time, if it's a symptomatic cord compression, start them on steroids. If the CT sim is not available on the weekend, which is common, um, then we need to treat the patient on the treatment machine. And the best way to do that is like this obtain a large film in the area, either an AP or a PA image, reduce the field to include once two vertebral bodies above and below the target, and that way you're really making sure you're not missing. So even if there's a shift, you're not gonna miss your target, 
and then you want to make sure that laterally you're at least two centimeters wide. And again, the goal of this is to make sure we don't miss. What we're prescribing to is in general APPA to midplane or PA, that's anterior posterior and a PA, posterior anterior, and then just treating the dose, let's say you're delivering three gray, so one and a half gray coming in from one side, one and a half gray coming in from the other side, or depending on the patient's anatomy, sometimes you can get away with just the PA field delivering all three gray to the PA. For the cervical spine in general, we tend to do laterals that help spare the stuff in front, i.e. the esophagus or the mouth. Um, and you wanna obviously treat them in that case with their arms down. And then once Monday comes and you can use, when you have your whole team there, it's definitely worth getting a CT sim and continuing the treatment from that point forward with better imaging. The next very common emergency we're going to be called about is brain metastasis. So here we have a case, 54-year-old female presented at an emergency department with altered mental status. The CT imaging identified lesions in the liver, lung, and brain concerning for malignancy. Liver biopsy was done. Good job. We got a tissue biopsy. Confirms non-small lung cancer. So now we look at these images. What do you think? So let me run through them quickly with you. On the top, we're dealing with a T1 with contrast and shows two relatively large lesions in the brain and a third one posteriorly as well. And then on the bottom, the T2 flare image shows what's causing the symptoms. It is all that edema causing those symptoms for this patient. So what should we do? Well, first of all, like we discussed earlier, always ask about what symptoms the patients are having. And when you see images like that, what symptoms do we think the patient most commonly will present with? Headache, AMS, seizures, visual change, weakness, nausea, vomiting, or asymptomatic? Headache and altered mental status are the two most common symptoms that patients with symptomatic brain metastasis commonly present with. The other symptoms are all there. And I, the asymptomatic number, especially as we increase the number of patients that we're screening, definitely may be going up. Similar to before, if we're being called in on the weekend to treat someone emergently, then we need to start steroids, same dose as before, 10 milligrams bolus, four milligrams, Q6 hours, if they're very symptomatic, like this patient was in this presentation, and then again, the, the recommendations are always to taper as quickly as possible. <clears throat> Whole brain radiation therapy can also be, be planned and delivered emergently. What do you do? You put them on the table, you create an acoplast mask with mobilization, you put BBs at the lateral canthi, and you measure the separation with, the with a measuring uh, device from the temple to the temple, lower borders at the C1, C2 interspace, you draw a block approximately one centimeter around the brain, and you come up with a plan to treat the midplane. 30 gray, 10 fractions, opposed lateral fields, prescribe to midplane, use 6MV. Now, a lot of this might sound a little bit like Chinese now. The bottom line is this is gonna become part of your lexicon as we go forward, no question. But the really, the important thing to remember, even at this point in time, if this is starting to sound overwhelming, is you're never alone. You got an attending with you, and really more important for a lot of this stuff, you got a physicist with you. So working with your team, it'll be pretty easy to get these treatments done. Some anatomy when we're looking at a uh, at our plane film, we'll call it, of the of the skull is um, here, and I'm gonna kind of run through what it is that we're covering when we treat whole brain radiation. Obviously, we're trying to treat the entire brain. And what's important to recognize, especially, is the cribiform plate. Where is that is? Oh, I'll see it in a minute. And also where the temporal lobe is. We do not want to miss treating the temporal lobe if we're trying to treat the whole brain. And here it is. This is the roof of the orbit. This is the cribiform sinus. And that's the cella, while this is the edge of the temporal lobe. And therefore, a whole brain block will look like this, where you have the entire brain covered, including the temporal lobe here, 
and the cribriform plate. Down to, of course, C1, C2. This is another really common um, emergency that will be called about, which it's worth getting familiar how to manage. It's slightly different than the other two. So let's go through this. 52-year-old male, the 50-pack year smoking history, presents to the emergency department with progressive shortness of breath. Chest x-ray revealed the right upper lobe density, but he didn't get follow-up care. Shows up in the ED, and that's when you get called, and they're like, whoa, this guy's got edema in his face, and his right arm's distended, and his neck veins, and they take a picture, and they send it to you, and this is what it looks like. What do you do? So first of all, anytime we're thinking about Cipriana vena cava or anything, there's a diagnostic riddle that needs to be solved. So you assume it's cancer, because that's why they called you, the radiation oncologist. But what is the most likely diagnosis? Is it a germ cell tumor? Is it a non-small cell lung cancer? Is it a small cell lung cancer, lymphoma? Or, I don't know, maybe metastatic renal cell cancer? We don't know. So the most common cause of, of superior vena cava syndrome is actually non-small cell lung cancer on the metastatic side. And symptoms are really what we described in our case. Facial arm edema, distended neck and chest veins, dyspnea or orthopnea, that can be pretty scary, cough, headache, sometimes nasal stuffiness, lightheadedness, episodes of syncope, visual symptoms, hoarseness, strider, and confusion. So how do we manage this case of superior vena cava syndrome? Again, the referring doctor, they're scared. They don't know what to do. There's this mass. They think it might be cancer. So they called you, the radiation oncologist. So what you got to do is, first of all, make sure the patient's on oxygen and stabilize the symptoms. So that was done. So what's the most appropriate next step in management? Should we start chemo? Should we get emergent radiation going? Should we get a diagnosis and maybe stage the patient? Or should we stent the patient with interventional radiology? And similar to the first two cases, and similar, really important to drive home this point, try to get a tissue diagnosis. This is actually really important when it comes to SVC, as we're about to see why. The quickest way to manage SVC is through intraluminal stenting. It is the quickest palliation of symptoms, does not interfere with the workup because we're going to see if it's a small cell lung cancer, a lymphoma, or a germ cell tumor, start with systemic therapy. They respond really well to chemotherapy and their symptoms, which is actually the appropriate treatment for their entire disease, and will manage their symptoms really well as quickly potentially as radiation. For non-small cell lung cancer, start radiation right away. Three to four gray per fraction for three days, then, of course, CT sim, give concurrent radiation if it's, uh, let's say, a uh, locally advanced lung cancer, non-metastatic. Then, of course, we can go to full dose concurrent chemo radiation therapy. If it is metastatic, something like 30 gray and 10 fractions this is an excellent dose to go to. Ah, I just jumped ahead and gave the answer to this, potentially. Let's see. So, biopsy to lung mass showed non-small cell lung cancer. Further workup confirmed several small asymptomatic brain metastasis, otherwise known as this patient fully staged has metastatic lung cancer. So what is the most appropriate treatment for his lung mass? A, 30 grain 10, B, 20 grain 5, C, 66 and 33, that's a lot of fingers, once daily fractions, or 8 gray, repeated if needed, one week apart. Dealer's choice, but if it's metastatic, you don't got to go to 66 gray and 33 fractions. Another common call that you're going to be getting throughout your career, this is super common, and uh, on the weekends as well, is bone mets. Indication for treatment are pain, but because we have really good pain relief options, pain is rarely an emergency. Now, that doesn't change the initial approach. Make sure they have a diagnosis might not be a bone met, and go see the patients, evaluate the patients. But 
oral and IV pain control can usually be utilized until the clinic's open, until the entire team's in place, then we can CT sim and treat the patient appropriately once everyone is there. So let's talk about a case of a bone met, but with an added complication in there. Let's see. Patient presents with a painful bony metastasis in the femur. And there's concern that there might already be a pathologic fracture there. What do you do? A, just treat the site of bone disease with radiation therapy. B, biopsy and make sure that there is actually cancer. C, get additional imaging with x-rays to ensure no impending fractures. Or D, get additional imaging with a PET CT to determine the size of all of that lesion and any other lesion. So in this case, first things first is get an x-ray. Make sure we're not dealing with an impending fracture. Once we're fixing that fracture if needed, of course, if needed, we can always get biopsy of that site too. If a pathologic fracture is present, stabilization becomes a priority, regardless of the reason of what caused this fracture whether it's osteopenia, whether it's osteoporosis, whether it's a MET. So therefore, if that x-ray shows that we're dealing with a likely pathologic fracture, stabilization, especially of the femur, which is a weight-bearing bone, becomes the priority. Once that's done, and if needed, they got a biopsy of that site, it is super appropriate to treat with radiation therapy to that bone MET. So, what would be the most appropriate dose and fractionation scheme for this treatment? A, 30 gray and 10 fractions. B, 24 gray and eight fractions. C, 20 gray and five fractions. D, 16 gray and one fraction, otherwise known as SRS. Or E, eight gray and one fraction. Real dealer's choice all these could be appropriate. And what is the likelihood the patient will experience pain relief with the radiation? Is it half? Is it like very few of them? Is it like a lot of them? 70% of patients will experience pain relief. 60 to 80% will have at least a partial response and up to 40% will have a complete response to their pain, which is why they're calling us to take care of these patients. Not an emergency, but definitely something we can really do to help our patients. So again, let's run through the plan. Patients with a pathologic fracture should be definitely evaluated by surgery prior to radiation, especially if it's in a weight-bearing bone. Single fraction or multi-fraction regimens are associated with similar degree, similar degree of pain relief, and single fraction treatments, though, are associated with an increased likelihood of the need of retreatment. Now, Eight gray in a single fraction to retreat, pretty easy to do, but there's definitely reason to use longer fractionation courses or higher doses like SBRT if we think the patient has excellent performance status and is likely to live a long time. Hemoptysis, another pretty common cause. This is actually pretty scary. Think about it from the referring doc's point of view. The guy's hanging out, doing his thing, and suddenly at 11 a.m., 11 p.m., I'm sorry, who's calling at 11 a.m.? At 11, p at 11 p.m., the, you know, they ring for the nurse, and they're coughing up blood. So the nurse calls the doc on the floor and says, Doc, patient in room 303 is coughing up blood. And so the doctor looks up the chart, sees the patient has known cancer, and immediately calls radiation oncology and says, Help us! This guy just coughing up blood! That's what's going on. So... Definitely worth listening to the story, going in, seeing the patient, managing things. Because when we do, not only are we going to be helping the patients, but of course we're also going to be helping the entire team so they can take care of better care of this patient and all patients. So what's the case? 64-year-old 64, 64 male with known metastatic lung cancer being treated with chemotherapy. We know this patient has cancer. And he presents after an episode of coughing up blood. First things first, like in a lot of things, we're not always the fastest way to manage these symptoms. So interventional pulmonology comes on board right away. They perform a bronch. They cauterize some suspicious blood vessels that they think is causing the bleeding. 
because the tumor is invading into that area, but the patient is still bleeding. So what do we do? Should we treat 30 grain, 10 fractions? Should we treat 20 grain, five fractions? 66 grain, 33 fractions? Or eight grain, two fractions, one week apart? Yeah, you know the answer to this. There we go. The patient has metastatic disease. So almost any one of these regimens would be appropriate. The only one that would just not be appropriate in the setting of metastatic disease is long course radiation. Another case of bleeding that we do get called about and is vaginal bleeding. Case would be a 78 year old female, no past medical history presents with heavy vaginal bleeding. Pelvic exam is done on the floor, shows a cervical mass and the bleeding intensifies. They check an H&H &H and it's low. So they call you. Step one, similar to the step one of every case until now pretty much, confirm a diagnosis of malignancy. Make sure we're actually dealing with cancer. Step two in vaginal bleeding is the guide team can do vaginal packing. And that actually, in many cases, stems the bleeding and gives us the time we need to manage everything. IR and surgery should always get, be involved to evaluate whether embolization is appropriate. And then vaginal bleeding packing doesn't manage this. If IR and surgery are no, unable to embolize and stop the bleeding, radiation should definitely be considered. And similar to the others, we can try 30 grain, 10 fractions, 20 gray in five fractions, or eight gray in a single fraction. Any of these approaches are appropriate. At the same time, definitely worth discussing with your attending and team, because a lot of this will depend on does the patient have metastatic disease? Is this someone that we're gonna to wanna to treat definitively in the near future? And that's why earning that time with the packing or getting an IR to embolize it is really important, especially in the setting of vaginal. So summary, Go see the consult of PAGED. Okay, even if you're not likely to treat, just go see the patient. Number one, you're nice. The patients like you, we know that. Come on, everyone in Radonk's pretty nice. And uh, we really add something when we go and see the patients. We know that. But number two, and I think even really, a really, really important component is the fact that when they're calling us, it's because the team is concerned. The team has a problem that they do not know how to manage. And when we show up, and tell them, it's not a problem, don't worry about it. That hemoptysis, that's been there a while. He's not really coughing up blood. It's just blood tissue sputum. We have time to manage this. Whatever it is, even if we don't end up treating the patient, being involved, going and seeing the patient will help the team and the patient. Review imaging with the, radi with the radiologist on call. They are your best friends. Verify path, okay? Most of the time they have pathology for these patients, but a lot of times they don't yet have pathology. So make sure that pathology is happening, that they're getting it. Always make sure that if the patient had prior radiation to that site, they may have just finished for this emergent issue last week. If we do think that you're gonna to have to treat, notify the therapist on call. Decide the treatment plan, if you're gonna be treating at all with the attending. Obviously go in there, dictate an HMP console note, Schedule the simulation for the next working day, even if you're going to be treating emergently on the weekends. And then, this is actually really important, the day after you emergently treat a patient, follow up. Make sure everything is happening right. Really, when you're on call, it's kind of tough, a little bit lonely, but you are managing the patient and they are counting on you. Questions to ask. Is this a true emergency? Is the patient even symptomatic? Question number two, are there superior or equivalent alternatives to radiation? For example, a symptomatic brain mat? Surgery works really well. Interventional procedure or surgery for bleeding can work well. And if it's a very chemosensitive tumor, such as small cell lung cancer or a lymphoma, chemotherapy might be the appropriate first step. Decompression is more effective for radiation for immediate relief. And pain medication is more effective than radiation for immediate relief. Surgery on IR are more effective to control acute bleeding than radiation is. Because controlling bleeding can take uh, two to three fractions if we're going at three gray per fraction. And if the patient is really acutely bleeding out, we might not have that much time. 
And really, really important is don't forget the big picture. If the patient is unstable in the ICU, transporting them down to the floor to our department to treat might not be the best approach. Make sure the ICU team is available, make sure to discuss with the ICU team and make sure it's best for the patient at this time to be taken out of their acute care environment to the radiation oncology department. Good luck to you all. Uh, we at IROC and your entire training team is here for you. And we really hope that these slides and this entire course was helpful. Thank you very much. Feedback is always appreciated. I'm on Twitter. I'm via email. You find me, reach out. Thanks a lot. Good luck, y'all.